Good morning, everybody. Um, apologies to people sitting behind me. It feels a bit odd. I sort of want to be there, but I think there's a lady with the camera, so I have to sit down. Um, I'm also happy with slides, because if you ever do anything with a Twitter fall, nobody listens to you. They just look for the funny tweets. So I have some slides, but it's not death by PowerPoint. Um, okay, so I'm from Storyful, and I've worked uh, with Storyful since March. They're based in Dublin. Uh, they were started two years ago by Mark Little, who was a foreign correspondent uh, for RTE for 20 years. And just as Ruth was talking about, it was during the Iran crisis where he couldn't go to Tehran. And he was on the phone to all of his foreign correspondent friends saying, what on earth is happening in Iran? And they said, we, we don't know, we can't get out of the hotel. So we're basically doing that foreign correspondent thing, of standing on the rooftop of a hotel, pretending that we know what's happening, and we don't. But they said to Mark, what you need to do is look at Twitter and YouTube and you'll see what's happening on the streets. So Mark did that, but also realised as a journalist, he had no idea what was right and what was wrong. And exactly as Ruth said, recognised that there was a need to create a service for news organisations that was doing the verification and doing it to exactly the same levels as we've always done as journalists. So I'm going to talk to you today about how we discover and verify content on social networks. As you know, every hour, no, sorry, every minute, 72 hours of content are uploaded to YouTube, 700,000 pieces of content are shared on Facebook, 100,000 tweets. That's every minute. So for a journalist, 99% of that is rubbish. From a journalistic point of view, 1% is golden. And it's the same from a dip diplomatic perspective. How do you sort through all of that stuff and find the good stuff? And then how do you verify it? So the, the kind of the ground, uh, the foundation of Storyful is we have over 300 hand-curated Twitter lists. And they're hand-curated because if Jeremy Bowen moves from Syria to Afghanistan, he moves off our Syria list and moves on to our Afghanistan list. The people talking about X Factor on a Saturday night makes, you know, makes Twitter less useful. You have to find those journalists and those people on the ground that you trust and use them as sources. So we have a list of lists and we are using them to, to basically work out who's right and then put algorithms on top of those Twitter lists to find the key information. And then we, when we find that key information, bring the journalists back in to do the verification. So it's this terrible phrase, but we use the phrase human algorithm, because algorithms will only take you so far. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of our technology. But we are people, and we are people who spend the days looking at different social networks. Reddit is increasingly becoming an interesting news source. We've talked about Weibo, we've got a Hong Kong bureau with people there specifically looking at Chinese social networks. You have to understand the different news stories and where it emerges. Syria, for example, Facebook is where Syrian activists talk to each other in large numbers. So Twitter, we talk about Twitter a lot, but actually it's understanding which platforms are right for which news stories. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the Costa Rica earthquake that happened um, in September, but I'll also talk to you a little bit about the Guatemala one this week. Um, we use Twitter velocity, so we have those 300 lists, and we know the speed at which any particular list moves. And we know, for example, in South Korea, at any particular day, the average speed at which that list moves. If that list starts moving more quickly, an alert goes off, and we as journalists go in and see why has it started moving more quickly. Sometimes it's because it's a TV soap opera happening, and there's enough people talking about it as if it's real life. But with the Costa Rica earthquake, um, you can see here that the epicenter was there. It took 90 seconds to, to go the shockwaves to move to Nicaragua. Within those 90 seconds, Temblor, as you will see here, had become the trending topic. And the alert went off to say, which is obviously Spanish for earthquake. And I love the fact that within 90 seconds, the earth is moving, but people take their phone out of their pockets and tweet Temblor, okay? which is great for, for, to find, for finding out information. It's slightly odd from a human perspective. Um, but so within 90 seconds, we were alerted to that. And it's the same with Guatemala. By the time it had crossed into Ecuador, our Ecuador list lit up with the same, there's something happening within 90 seconds. So what you're seeing is, particularly around these sorts of stories, it's an early, kind of an earlier war warning system, which allows you to then go in and gives you more of a head start to do the work that you need to do. So um, this is the alert bot, which we're talking about a plane crash in France. It's a mixture of velocity and keywords to work out when a story is breaking and then on the basis of that, this isn't something that we give to newsrooms, this is an internal tool to help us as journalists have an early warning. Um, but I just want to talk a little bit about this verification piece. Um, it's, as a startup, to be totally honest, the Arab Spring has allowed us to do work because social media was so critical in that story and journalists couldn't get into Syria. But because Syria is being, social media has been used by activists to tell a story, it was even more important to hone our verification skills. 
So whenever we find a video from Syria, it becomes a little bit like CSI Miami, in that we will cross-reference with Google satellite imagery, we will be talking to activists on the ground, we'll do cross-references with the weather, <laughs> you, can, you can use Wolfram Alpha to say what was the weather like on the 10th of February in Damascus. We will talk to people on the ground and say, were you there, what camera were we using? We'll use te technology to cross-reference exit data. So we'll do all of this to be able to say, yes, this is something that we can stand by. And sometimes, for example, there was a particularly gruesome video of some rivers being dumped, uh, some bodies being dumped over a river. We could look at the shadows on the bridge so we knew which direction the river was moving. We could tell from the tiles on the ground using satellite imagery which of those bridges were. But it took us 20 minutes to cross-reference 72 bridges using satellite imagery to work out which bridge it was. Now, we did all of that, and we became pretty certain that those bodies had been dumped over that bridge. But the activists were saying it had happened this week, but we knew from, from some of our research that the river wasn't that high at that particular time of year. So we could verify 90% of that video, but the last 10%, we had concerns over the timing of it. And it's the same with activist videos where we can say, yes, it's the right day, yes, it's those activists, yes, that's, that shelling is happening right now. But the smoke in the background, we can't tell you whether that's from a shell that's just dropped on the rooftop or whether it's because it's a tyre that the activists have lit themselves to make it look worse. So people say to us, can you just give us a tick to say, yes, you verified this. People are looking for 100% verification. But actually, we have to learn the tools to say what do we know and what we don't know. So just very quickly, this was last Friday. There were some execution videos that emerged from Syria. Um, very gruesome. And there was lots of people, the UN included, saying we need to verify these videos because this could be a war crime. And what we're seeing now is much of this stuff is on YouTube. And we work with YouTube to take down the most gruesome imagery, but also to get them to save this, because a lot of this war is playing out online. And actually, if we haven't caught up with what does that mean and what should we be saving and, you know, in terms of history and archive. Um, so we actually, this is now online, we, we put everything that we do online and we ask people to help us. We collaborate our verification techniques to say what do people know on the ground um, and, we, and at the end we come up with what we know. And so we were able to do this and then share that with the UN and Amnesty to say this is the work that we've done. But, you know, these types of things, the way that news is now merging with diplomacy and foreign policy and NGO and activism, we should be working much more closely together and understand what skills we all have and who's expert in this and, and works better to do, to do a better job. Um, so I'd be happy to answer any questions in the Q&A in terms of this, but I think our, our expertise is newsrooms now are turning to Twitter more than ever before. So all of you that are from embassies around the world, all of you, we, have, we are monitoring every day for the information that you give. Uh, we work with the New York Times, um, Reuters, Al Jazeera, BBC, all the major news organisations, and they will say to us, what do you know about this? And for example, with the FCO, there was a case where we knew from your Twitter account that William Hague was about to give a statement. We were able to say to the New York Times, it's okay, you know, the Foreign Office is about to make a statement, William Hague is there at that refugee camp. So the work that you're doing on Twitter, the, the ways that news organisations are increasingly using that as a way to decide what to cover, what to, not to cover, who to talk to, don't underestimate the ways that journalists now have five screens in front of them and are using social media as a source of storytelling and which stories to cover and which not. And being able to, to create your own personal networks with journalists, and your point was really well made, your official accounts do a certain job, but your personal accounts as diplomats and the relationships you can build with journalists are absolutely key because journalists really are making decisions about what to cover based on those DMs that they're getting from people and on the back channel. So, yeah, I can definitely talk more about that, how newsrooms themselves are using social media. Thank you.